All right, welcome back to another SSL Family Faith episode. Uh, I'm so glad to be here and uh, have the privilege of talking to you guys about or sharing with you uh, from God's Word uh, all about marriage. And it is uh, something we're going to start kind of a series. We're going to be talking about marriage over the next few weeks, uh, getting down to the, the basics. We're going to start real basic today and define marriage and talk about what the Bible tells us about family and about marriage and about a husband and a wife and, and uh, kind of what, what, the, what the whole thing is about. And uh, from here, we're going to talk uh, more about men and more about women and their roles in marriage and talk about uh, um, all kinds of other things uh, coming up over the next few weeks. So look forward to that uh, These uh, in kind of a series, I guess a mini series about, about marriage. So marriage has been completely, I don't want to say destroyed, but it sure has been uh, messed up by the world. It is under attack from just about every angle in the world. It's under attack in the media. It's under attack in schools. It's under attack in in families, it's under attack and, and, and from every direction and by every group, it seems like. this The institution, the very idea of marriage and what it is, is under attack. And it is, uh, it, it's something that people have just completely lost the, the concept of what marriage really is, what the point of marriage is. And so uh, that's what I want to talk about. This is not just for people who are married, okay? This is important for everyone to understand. If you are a younger single person, an older single person, somebody who has been married and divorced, uh, maybe some things went wrong, whatever, this is for you. This is for people looking to get married, people who are married, and people who uh, are any any stage of life. Marriage is an institution that is important to us all. Even if you plan to never get married, it says in the Bible that um, it is good for us all to get married, except for there is certain people that... Uh, are called to stay single and uh, do the work of God in different ways. And there's nothing wrong with that either. Uh, but it's still important for us all to understand what marriage is. People don't understand anymore. And they have uh, come up with all these reasons to get married that have nothing to do with, with really what marriage is. Uh, people talk, you know, I have nieces and nephews. I have uh, people in my family, that uh, 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 friends and, and all kinds of things they hear about all the time. People, they, they get married because... You know, they, they, they want to, they, they both have all these bills, right? They're separate. They, they can save money. Let's, let's get married because there's some kind of financial gain that we're going to get. There's some savings, right? So we're going to save on our bills. You know, so let's think about all the things. It's such a waste for us to live apart. Let's, let's live together and get married and do all these things together. I can put you on my health insurance at my job and we'll, we'll, all these benefits, none of which has to do with the actual reasons for marriage. But this is what people think. This is what people want. Well, we get you know government support or this or that, or there's certain certain reasons that, that we think about. Not the reason, the real reasons to get married. People uh, want to buy houses together. People get married because they want to please their parents. Lots of times, I see this happen all the time. I've seen this happen uh, in many cases where parents are, are pressuring the kids, you, you, you guys should get married, you should get married. And so you should get married to this person. Uh, you know, we don't have arranged marriages anymore, but we certainly have a lot of parents that push marriage on kids um, and, uh, and, and kind of set things up, don't they? And a lot of kids get married because they want to please their parents. It's not the reason and it's not what marriage is designed for. It's not what God's marriage is about. Um, these, uh, these ideas of, you know, this is what we're supposed to do. Um, and I think for a lot of women, especially this idea, this fantasy idea of this wedding, this wedding day and the dresses and the, the people and the flower girl walking down the aisle and this, this magical fantasy ceremony and all these things, which are beautiful and great. And those things are wonderful because that, that day is an important day, but that's not the reasons that we get married to just have that day because there are a whole lot of days after that that we need to focus on uh, that are much more important. But just as many, just as for, you know, people decide to get married for lots of silly reasons or reasons that might not be silly but might not be really the right reasons, people also decide not to get married in today's day and age for probably even more reasons that are just as uh, falsely uh, um, uh, um, derived from something that is not the truth. And I, I, this is things I hear all the time. We're not going to get married because it might not work. There's a lot of, people get a lot of divorce in the world. You know, marriage. I just see so many marriages not work. So we're not going to get married. What we're going to do instead is we're going to live together, and we're going to try this whole thing out for a while. Sometimes I see these relationships, and 
it, this sounds crazy to me now, uh, but I thought the same way when I was in my 20s. A I absolutely thought that the, the institution of marriage was you know, not something that, that I really cared that much about. I didn't respect very much because of the things that I'd seen in my life. And so instead, I uh, didn't thought that everyone just lived together. That was just, that's, that's what we did now. This is 2000, you know, whatever it was, 2010. This is 2019. We don't care about this stuff. Everybody lives together. You know, boyfriend, girlfriend, even if they're not engaged, it doesn't even matter anymore. Let's just live together. Let's just, we'll buy a house together. We'll rent a house together. We'll get, we'll live together. We, we, we can pretend we're married and uh, we'll see how things go. And, and if things don't really work out for us, uh, if this doesn't work out, if I don't really like you anymore, or if something changes, uh, well, we'll just go our separate ways and then we'll go find someone else. Maybe we'll even have kids together during this whole process because we're you know, sleeping together and, and pretending that we're married. Uh, and then we'll have kids and then, well, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. There's no commitment. There's no real, real foundation. It's just this idea that we're going to, yeah, we're just doing this. We'll just see what happens. I see this all the time. And this is actually played off and encouraged by a lot of families and parents and schools. And it's, it's completely fine. It's completely normal. You know, 50, 60, even 70 years ago, if you would have, if this, this is not how things, you know, were done in, uh, we can talk about social uh, things, but uh, this is where we need to figure out what, what marriage is because other, otherwise we're completely lost. People, people don't want to get married because they don't want to commit. They don't want to, they don't want to, they want to be able to do their own thing. They have career aspirations. They have all these things that they've been, you know, trained up as, as a kid that they, you know, girls and, and boys or men and women, they, you know, you're, you're going to do this, you're going to do this, we're going to you know, train you up to do these things. And, and they have all these aspirations in life and, and they just may not have anything to do with, you know, oh gosh, having to give something up for someone else or do something that someone else wants. If, if you get married, then you have to deal with those things. People don't want to deal with that. They don't want to give up what they want for themselves. You know, we don't want to hinder our personal lives and all of our desires and the things that we want to do in life and slow those things down. This has become so confusing for people, including myself when I was in my 20s. You know, very critical age. And as a side note, this is why young adults are, are is such an important ministry. If you are in a church and if you are, are, are serving or involved or have any way to, to start or get involved with a young adults group, this is, a, this is a super important age. What happens is kids learn, they get in the Word, and, they're, and the, you know, the parents are bringing them to church and things like that, and people grow. You know, maybe they've given their life over to Jesus, and, they, and they, they, they feel this rebirth in their life, and they're starting to change. And then they graduate high school, they go off to college, and they're, they're gone. They're in the world, and, and they, sometimes they never come back. Uh, and and they get they get wrapped up in these false impressions of what they're supposed to do, and people just have no clue. It's so confusing for that age group, and they need to have a ministry. They need to have a home. They need to be cared for by a church family, uh, wherever they are in life, and so um, or wherever they are in the world. But that age group is super important, and uh, I wish I had a foundation when I was in, in my twenties. But with that being said, marriage is, is this idea that it's lost and our youth have no clue what it really means to be married and what the importance of it is and what it, what it truly is designed to be. God's marriage is something totally different than what the world tosses this idea of marriage around. It's the world's marriage is not God's marriage. They're totally different things. Relationships in general are totally different things. So in order to understand what God's marriage is, let's, let's get into the scripture <laughs> and uh, enough ranting about, uh, about the world. Genesis 2, 24, a verse that I've read uh, before on this channel and through other sermons and a verse that I generally read at, at weddings if, if I have had the pleasure or honor to do a couple different wedding ceremonies. And uh, th these, are, these are the verses right here. This is, the, this is the core, the meat of what marriage where it began in in god's creation he created the heavens and the earth and he creates all these things he creates man he creates woman and this is part of creation it was something special and set aside god's marriage is a well let's read this genesis 2 24 
Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This is God's marriage. This is the covenant of God's marriage that he put together, that he created, that he designed specially for a man and a woman to leave their father and their mother and to come together and become one flesh before God. A true covenant, a true covenant between a man and a woman before the Lord. And there's so much to be said about this and I, and I will go into um, even more detail on, on later uh, messages about about the, the consecrating of marriage and all these things and, and how it just it, it just literally blows my mind at how God designed all these things. But let's break this verse down. Let's let's look through what this verse is and what it means. It says, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother. And this is the first idea that we get of this complete family picture, right? A father and a mother with children. The children are leaving their mother and their father. This is what a, the God's family looks like. Now, if you're out there, if you don't have kids or you're married, that, that's I'm not saying everybody has to have kids or anything like that. There's God. That's it, it, all in God's hands. And so, for some couples, there it's not about kids. But this idea of a father and mother, of a man and a woman raising these kids. In this case, we're talking about these kids leaving their father and their mother. This complete picture of a family. This is God's family. This is what he designed us to be. Mothers and fathers of children. This is what he has put together. This is what marriage is is about. It's about the family. It's about creating this special thing that God has set aside. In in Exodus 2012, back to the 10 commandments. I know lots of people talk about the you know 10 commandments in the, in the comments and stuff like that in the law. Um, and I've talked about this before. God, you know, he, he, he's, he gives these commandments, right? The 10, right? Adultery, talking about uh, basically could break these down into two categories. Shouldn't have any other gods before me. Don't, you know, worship idols. Don't use the Lord's name in vain. Honor the Sabbath. All these things. This is part of the, you know, I guess the half of the commandments that, that are, are part of honoring God, Right? And then the other half of the Ten Commandments is about honoring others or honoring people, right? Don't covet your neighbor, all these things. Then there's the Fifth Commandment, which is about specifically about children obeying their parents. And it's it's something different. This commandment is set aside from all the rest because it has a promise attached to it. It says, honor your father and your mother so that your days will be long or so that you are, your days will be you know uh, fruitful or there's different different translations of that so basically so that you will live long and prosper kind of thing right this is what god has promised if you obey your parents there's a there's a structure set up and this is something special that god holds dear that he has created in a very particular way to be in in a very particular order. This is God's covenant of marriage in a family, a father and a mother with children. The children obey the parents. The parents respect and raise the children. There's many verses talking about how to be parents. Don't exasperate your children. Lots of things that that are are said about this family unit. Talks about throughout the Bible. God even sets it aside, all the commandments. And then you've got this one that doesn't really fit into the love God or love others category. It fits into this family unit category. And, and some would say that there's a third category uh, there as well. The family is set aside. It's a special thing. The creation of you know, children between a man and a woman, God's, God's blessing of children to you is, is something just it is something so special and life-changing. And again, I'm not, if you're married and do not have children, don't plan to have children, that's not in God's plan for you. That, there's nothing wrong with it. It doesn't say every, every you know, married couple has to have ch- children or anything like that. And I'm not saying that. Um, but it's something special. It's something, something very, very uh, um, set aside and respected that God, uh, God created this family unit through marriage. There's only one way to create a family. You, you can't create a family by pretending to be married and just having kids. It's not the same thing. That is not how God designed it. God designed a marriage, 
leaving a father and a mother and holding fast to his wife so that they become one flesh, there's, a, there's, a, there's something different that happens there. This is something special. This is not just living together with somebody. That is not marriage. That is not what God has designed it for. Reading on in Genesis 2.24, it says that a father, and as you shall leave his father and mother and hold fast, become attached to, hold fast to his wife. Now a new family has been created. A man and a woman, they come together. A man will hold fast to his wife, separate from the father and the mother. It doesn't say that you hold fast to your father and mother. It doesn't say that we're still under their authority, that we're still part of this old family. It says that we have left the father and the mother, and now we are to hold fast to our wife. Now we're together, and we're something different. We're something new. We've created, through God's covenant, we've created something new. He's created something new in us. This is also a place where things get confusing in the world because there's so much you know especially i think for younger married couples you know you feel like you're still yeah you still have to kind of follow your your mom and dad's lead you got to listen to them maybe they're telling you what to do and how to do things or whatever and you feel like you're, you're under their authority but you're not god has designed this so that you are no longer under their authority that you are now if you're a man you're now in authority in your marriage and you're now to be a respectable, God-following, God-fearing leader in your home. You know, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit. But you are something different now as, as a newly created unit. And you answer to each other and you answer to God. You don't answer to mom and dad anymore. That doesn't mean that, you know, we never talk to mom and dad anymore. But this is not about that. Your wife and your husband comes before mom and dad. It's, you are to honor them now. You are to care for them now. It's something different. You are to hold fast. You're becoming attached to. And I like how it says, his wife. Hold fast to his wife. It's almost as if, it's almost as if it, this, is, this is saying here, and I might be reading too far into this, but this is almost saying that as, as if God created this woman specifically for him. It was his wife. You know, leave mom and dad and he, here's a wife for you that God has created. And in this case, he very specifically created Eve for Adam. And I believe that God creates a, a wife for, for each man. If that is in your calling to get married, that he has a wife for you. He has a woman for you. And the interesting thing about how God's marriage works and how men and women, we are so different. On totally different ends of the spectrum. Men are, you know, <laughs> the men are from Mars and women are from Venus book. You know, it talks about all the differences. And sometimes my wife and I, we talk to each other and I swear we're, we're literally speaking foreign language to each other. You know, and we, I'm just like, where are you, where are you coming from? And, and she's thinking the same thing about me. We're, we're so, men and women are just designed so differently. Different wants, different needs, different desires, different things. And in the Bible, it like, totally outlines all of these things about men and women. They're not the same. But as you hold fast to your wife, this woman who has been created for you, this man who has been created for you, they've been created to completely complete each other. These, as, as, as you hold fast to your wife, as you become one flesh, all of the things that you are not as a man, all of the things that you're missing, all the parts of you, and believe me, guys, you're missing things, okay? You are not a whole person. When a, when a woman comes along, when, a, when, when, you are, when you are bound together with a woman in marriage, she completes you. She fills in all the gaps. And the same is in, in reverse. Women, you are, you are not whole. When a man and you are joined in marriage, you become one flesh, and you are something so much greater than you could ever be separately. You know, it's like one plus one equals a thousand. The math doesn't make sense, but God does. And, and, and that is what happens when men and women, when they come together in this covenant of marriage before God, they complete each other, they, they complement each other, they make something wonderful together. And that's what marriage is about. 
That's what, that's what this is about, holding fast to his wife. Then it goes on and says, and they shall become. And I love this part because shall become means that on the day of your marriage, you didn't instantly become the best husband or best wife or best married couple in the world because it says you shall become one flesh. You know, this is, at, this is like the, the idea of sanctification, if you're familiar with that, um, as a Christ follower, once we've given our life over to Jesus as our Savior, which we understood and, 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 and have faith and belief in what He's done for us on the cross, that we are sin, that our sin has been forgiven and that we can now be right with God just by believing in Him. And then that doesn't mean that we're instantly perfect Christians that know everything that has ever been written in this book and we know exactly how to live our life in a godly way and we, we can, you know, just go up and start preaching and, and, and you know, whatever. It, you know everything. Like, that's not how it works. There's a sanctification process, a process of learning where the, the Spirit will guide us and teach us and, and it says to help us to discern what is right and what is wrong and, and help to convict us of sin in our life and that we slowly start to change and weed things out. That is the same thing that happens in a marriage. When you, when you stand up there and you say the vows, you're not, like somebody doesn't wave a magic wand and you're like, bam, instantly the, the you know, 90th anniversary and you've got it all figured out. It's a, it's a process. We shall become. I, I know for, for uh, my wife and I, the first year of our marriage was, was by far the most difficult. And we had been together for many years before doing things the complete wrong way in learning many lessons through the through that process when we got married and we moved in together we got a house together and we and we had kids together things were tough the roles of husband and wife were not clear we had we had false ideas that weren't founded in the truth we had false expectations of one another and and it was a it was a, a we we butt heads a lot it was a lot of turmoil during that time because we shall become one flesh. Don't expect, you know, just because you got married that everything is different now. It takes work and it takes, it is a process and God is with us throughout it. And lastly, it says that we become one flesh. This is, this is God's marriage it's a complete union between two people, two totally different lives, from sometimes so so totally different families and 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 you know upbringings and and everything and men and women they're just totally different. And you bring these two people together, and through God you become something that's so you can't even realize that you're separate anymore. You complete each other in so many perfect ways, and with God's help molding you together in a marriage, it becomes something so amazing. This perfect, intimate union between a man and a woman, that you're so close that you look as one, that you act as one, that you decide together, that you live together, that you live this life, and that you focus on the mission that God has given you together as one. There's no separate missions for married couples. There's no, well, I called you to do this and I called you to do this. God calls us as one. God calls us as a married unit to serve in ways together. The, the plan never, never splits a marriage apart. God does not want marriage to, to, to be split apart here. We are one flesh. We're something different. Because God's marriage isn't just created just to be created. We have a purpose. We have a mission as a married couple, as a husband and wife. And there's a design for marriage. We're going to flip to Ephesians 5.31. And read this here. Uh, Ephesians 5.31 and 32. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Interesting, we just read that in Genesis. Of course, Paul here, being a devout and, and very educated Jew um, before uh, his conversion, uh, he was uh, quoting the Genesis 2.24 that we just read, quoting the Old Testament. And he, he quotes this very core verse that we just read about marriage. And then he says something interesting. 
This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. And, and, it, and he's almost like having this revelation as he's writing these words down to the church at Ephesus. He's writing these things down and he's, th he's saying to himself, hey, I know this is crazy, I know this is profound, but I'm, I'm talking about like when I say these verses about marriage that the two shall you know, leave their father and mother and be joined together and, and become one flesh, like th I'm talking about this, this is talking about Christ and his church. This isn't just talking about a man and a woman coming together. This is talking about Christ and his church. And it's this picture that God designed thousands of years before Jesus even was on the scene. You know, when these verses were written in Genesis about marriage, when God created marriage, he created marriage to be this picture of Jesus Christ who hadn't even come yet. A man and a woman together in marriage is a picture of the gospel. It is, it is the very demonstration of God's love through Christ and his church and his people in a man and a woman serving each other in marriage. Let's jump up a few verses and we're going to dig more into these things over the coming weeks because there's a whole lot to be said here. But if we jump back a few verses up to verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify by her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. This is the role of the husband. This is, the, is God's marriage. This is the husband's role. He is to mimic and demonstrate Christ's love for how Christ loved the church. The, this is how Christ loved his people. Okay, when we, when we talk about the church here, we're talking about Christ, God, God's people, people who've given and devoted themselves over to Christ, people who've believed in him and given their lives over to Christ. They are added to his church, right? A man in a marriage, a husband, is to give himself over, is to lay himself down, is to just as Christ gave himself up, as Christ, God, came down and humbled himself, as we talked about last week, humbles himself in, in the form of a man, beaten and dragged through the streets, died on a cross that was made for thieves and criminals, all so that he gave up everything so that we, his church, could be free of sin and have what we want and what we need, which is eternal life with God. He gave everything up for his church. He gave it all up. This is what the husband's role is in a marriage. A husband is to honor and, and, and love and give himself up sacrificially, giving himself over his wants, his needs, his ideas for hers. She needs this. She caring for her, giving yourself to her, taking time away from what you want to do. And we're going to, again, I'm going to dig into this and, and, and the husband's role a lot more next week. But this is exactly the role of a husband, demonstrating Christ's ultimate love and sacrifice for the church in a marriage. This is how it's supposed to look. Back a few verses. Let's see what he has for wives. Verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and he is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Okay, so husbands, you're to lay your life down for your wife. You're to give it all up for her. You are to throw it all out the window and, and serve your wife and care for her and love her like no one else in the world. You are in, in a way to submit to her needs above your own. Okay? Doesn't say necessarily, we're not talking about submitting to her leadership or a spiritual leadership or things like that. It's talking about you are to submit yourself to her needs over your own needs. You know, you are to love her like you love your own body, it says in, in another verse here. Then we've gone over to the wives. Well, wives, you are called to submit yourselves to your husbands just as Christ submits, or just as the church submits themselves to Christ. As believers in Jesus Christ, as Christ's church, we submit ourselves to his leadership. He is the head of the church. We submit ourselves to him, his teachings. We, we, we respect him. We care, you know, we, we love the church and we love him. We love Christ. 
That is, as a church, what we do. This is the woman's role. This is her demonstration of the gospel in the marriage. She is to love and respect and care for her husband. She is to submit to his leadership in the home as it says that he is the head of the home. We're going to talk a lot more about this because this is something that gets totally twisted out of context here and, and, and abused by people, especially men. But this is the perfect picture of the gospel. This is the mission of God's marriage. The husband giving himself up for his wife. The wife giving herself up for the husband. And these two submitting to each other as they both submit to God. And it creates this love in a relationship that that you just cannot have without God. You cannot have it without God. And you, everywhere you go, while displaying this picture of the gospel. As you walk around, as you do life, believe me, there are people watching you and your marriage. There are people watching how you interact with one another. There are people watching how you care for and raise up your children. There are people watching you as a Christian follower of Jesus, what your marriage looks like. And it can either be a light, a beacon of hope, to all those around that don't know and don't have hope without Jesus Christ. Your marriage can become this beacon of hope to everybody out there. And that's what we're meant to be. That's what God's called us to be. This is God's marriage. A true picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. A covenant literally meant to be sealed in blood between a man and a woman just as Jesus' blood wiped us clean of our sins. God at the center of marriage. An example of the gospel, an example of the sacrifice of Jesus and His church for one another. Meant to be a light in the world. This is God's marriage. And I know that... uh, a lot of the stuff is confusing. We get into the roles of husband and wife in a marriage, and, and, and some of the things I think have just been, you know, the world will use certain verses in the Bible. I've talked about this in the past, where they'll pull things out and they'll say, "Oh, this is what this is what your Bible says," you know, and they'll use that to demean men or women, or say that marriage isn't, you know, it's an old institution, and that's how things used to be. It's a patriarchy, all these different things. We're going to talk about those things next week and in the weeks to come. God created something beautiful between man and woman in in, in the covenant of marriage. And it's something, it's really held dear to him because it's the very fabric and foundation of society here on earth. And it's the very fabric and foundation of Jesus' gospel that's being shared throughout the world. And, And he uses marriage to share that news with all the unbelievers, everybody who has not heard it. Like marriage is, is, a, is a tool of God's and it's meant to be something so great. And we cannot let the world tear that down. We need to stick to the truth. And, uh, and that's, that's where the true hope and, and happiness in a marriage is found. Without it, they're, they're, I'm telling you that they're just, there's a lot of turmoil. And, uh, and this is what marriage needs. This is the, the foundation that we need to believe in and understand. And uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed and maybe learned something today. Uh, I'd love to hear your comments, of course, down below, as always. And uh, I always uh, offer this, and, and I will always continue to do that. Uh, I would love to pray for you. If you have anything, especially if it's marriage-related this week, um, you know, what are you going through? Email me. It's private. I, I'm not going to, you know, no one will know. Uh, even your husband or wife won't know. If you need to pray for something specifically, please email me. Let me know. Uh, comment down below if you'd like it to be public where everyone can pray for you together if you have something that you'd like to share there just put in the comments Um, you can email me at sslfamily5 at gmail.com and uh, I will I will pray for you my wife and I uh, we sit down and take some time and we read through comments we pray right on the spot generally or we'll take some time and do it later in the week uh, as well so we want to pray for you guys Um, and as always guys thanks for watching have a good one